I stumbled out of the patio, club in hand. The damn dogs were rummaging through my trash again. I was awakened by the sound of a dumpster overturning. This was the third time in a week, and I was already sick of it. Why can't people keep their damn dogs at home? I knew that the dogs were just hungry, but that didn't make me feel any better. I stealthily opened the back gate and prepared to jump out and punish the mangy dogs. I threw open the gate and rushed to the trash containers. There were two dark figures next to a container that had been knocked over on its side. I raised my baton and they noticed me. Please, mister, we're just hungry, one of them said. We'll clean everything up. Don't hit us. These were not dogs, but two children. They were definitely wild, though. It was dark there so I grabbed them by the collars and dragged them into the backyard under the security lights. I picked them up and examined them. They were tattered and dirty. They looked like tramps. They wore tatty baggy clothes and baseball caps. It was cold outside and I saw them shivering. Did you two turn over my trash earlier in the week? I asked. They looked at each other. Yeah, you always leave something like pizza or something in your trash, one of them said. I'm sorry we did this. We won't do this anymore. Just let us go, mister. We won't bother you anymore. We'll clean everything up. This will not work. I grabbed them tightly by their shirts and led them inside. I took them straight to the bathroom, pushed them inside, and closed the door. Don't go out until I return, I said. I went and grabbed some of my ex-wife's sweatpants, sweatshirts, clean socks, and big fluffy towels. I carried them to the bathroom and opened the door. They tried to open the window and escape. You may like to be dirty, I told them, but I don't think a hot shower will hurt you. There is soap and shampoo here. Here are clean clothes and towels. Undress and get into the shower. We don't like being dirty, the larger one hissed at me. We don't have as good a shower as you. Are you just going to stand there? You might steal something, I said. Yes, that's right, said the kid. We're not going to steal your toilet paper. We are not thieves. Are you some kind of pervert, mister? Do you like little girls? I was stunned. Now that I looked closer, there were definitely girls underneath all that dirt. I, I, I faltered. I didn't know you were girls. Just clean yourself up and I'll bring you something to eat. Come to the kitchen when you're cleaned up and I'll feed you. I left them in the bathroom and went to the kitchen. I opened the refrigerator and looked around. There was cold fried chicken, half a bowl of potato salad, a half-eaten tray of vegetables, some sandwich pastrami, and dill pickles. I divided the chicken into two plates. There were three pieces each and I added a big mound of potato salad. I put the vegetables on a plate and took out some sauce for them to dip into. A few pickles on the plate, a pastrami sandwich for each of them, and some chips for me, and them too if they wanted would round out a pretty good dinner, I thought. I hoped they would like the Munster cheese, mayonnaise, and mustard on their sandwiches. I heard the bathroom door open quietly, and a whisper was heard outside the kitchen door. A minute later, two of the most beautiful girls I have ever seen walked into my kitchen. They had long, dark black hair and olive skin, the greenest eyes on earth, slightly almond-shaped, High cheekbones and just the cutest little noses imaginable made them a real match. They looked like they were still in their teens, maybe 11 or 12 years old. It was fun to see them in Brianna's clothes. She is a tall girl, and they were very small. They had their sleeves and trouser legs rolled up, and they looked like tramps. Pull up a chair, I invited them. Do you like Coca-Cola or do I have juice or milk? They both wanted milk. My name is McKay North, I told them, pouring milk. I placed it on the counter in front of them. Who are you? My name is Maggie, said the larger one. It's short for Margaret. She's Stokely. Can we really eat it all? You can have more if you want sandwiches, I said. I'll cook for you in the morning. I won't cook at 2 a.m. No, that's good. Thank you, Stokely said. Maggie looked at me suspiciously. What do you want from us? We don't do any nasty things. I laughed. No, me too. If any of you have any plans for my virtue, you will be disappointed. They clearly didn't understand my sense of humor. I'm not available to little girls, I said. 
I could tell they didn't like the little girl's reference, but they started eating. They ate like wolves. Hey, hey, slow down, I told them. Chickens don't try to escape. The chickens are dead and the potatoes have never been very fast. Your stomach will hurt. This made them chuckle, but they began to eat less greedily. Where do you girls live? I asked them. There's an empty house at the end of the block, Maggie said. We found a mattress, and we have something to cover ourselves with. However, we are afraid that drug addicts will move there. Once they know it's empty, they'll do it. Do you want to sleep in a warm, clean bed today? I asked them. They looked at me suspiciously again. Not mine, I laughed. I have three free bedrooms. Well, they're mine too, but you know what I mean. They chuckled nervously. We have no money, Stokely said. We can't pay you. We collect tin cans, but we just spend it all on food. I'm not asking you to pay me, I said. Did you hear me say that I want you to pay me? Why are you doing this, she asked. Why are you so kind to us, Mac? Mac. Call me Mac, I said. Everyone does it. Why are you being so nice, Mac? She asked. I'm not playing cute in any way, I told her. I'm a good guy, just ask my mom. This brought smiles to their faces. I liked it. I decided that I would make them do this often. If I were you, I would want someone to be kind to me, I said. They seemed to be considering it. Can I have some of these chips? Stokely asked. I pushed the bag and they both reached into it while they ate their sandwiches. I finished my sandwich. They drank milk and looked like they wanted more. I poured them another glass and they drank too. I was amazed, but they cleaned their plates down to the crumbs and ate all the vegetables. They must have been very hungry. Go to sleep, I told them. Each of you will have your own bathroom. There are toothbrushes, combs, and the like, aspirin, medicine for stomach pain, toothpaste, and dental floss in first aid kits. Anything else you need, you should ask me. Can we lock the doors? asked Maggie. Yes, but you must open them within a reasonable time if I ask you to, I said. They looked at me strangely. A light came on in Maggie's impossibly green eyes. He's afraid that we'll steal something, she told her sister. We won't steal anything, Mac. It's okay if you don't trust us. We don't really trust you either. I had to laugh. Okay, we have mutual distrust. You will soon realize that you can trust me. I almost never hurt beautiful girls. This brought another pair of dazzling smiles from me. I think they liked the pretty part. They followed me down the corridor and into their rooms. I heard the locks click and smiled to myself. Returning to bed, I lay awake for some time. What happened to these girls? Why were they going through my trash? Why were they on their own? Where is their family? I was going to get some questions answered in the morning. I was getting dressed when I heard the floor creaking in the corridor. I opened the door a crack and they crept into the living room. I decided they were about to leave, so I opened the door. They froze. Girls, are you ready for breakfast? I asked. They looked at each other. Maybe we should just leave, Maggie said. You're not going to lock us up or anything, are you? You mean, make you stay? I asked. They looked at each other again. They looked at me and nodded. No, I won't force you to do anything, I said. It's against my rules to force people to do something, but I would like you to have breakfast with me. They looked at each other again. Will you let us go after this? Stockley asked. If you want, I said. Actually, I was hoping you would want to spend the day with me. If you don't, that's okay if you have an appointment somewhere. Yes, we need to meet with our stockbroker. Maggie smiled. It lit her up like a Christmas tree. What are you going to feed us? No. What are you going to feed us? Are you an English teacher or something? Maggie asked. Actually, yes, I answered her. I teach English literature at the university. Cool, Stokely said. We don't go to school. Too busy. But you're having breakfast, aren't you? I was thinking about waffles with bacon. Do you girls like it? They did, so we went in and they got out the waffle iron while I was mixing the batter. They made waffles while I fried two pounds of bacon. I'm kind of a syrup snob. I'm a coffee snob, too. I let Maggie turn the bacon while I ground the coffee beans and turned on the coffee maker. 
It all came together pretty well, and we had real maple syrup and waffles. They disgusted me by asking if I had coffee creamer. I'm keeping some for the barbarians and Brianna, and they loved the vanilla cake. We ate all the bacon, and they each ate three waffles. Girls, stick with me, and in a week, you will be fat as toads, I told them. They both laughed, and it was the most wonderful sound I've ever heard. Then they drank the milk like hungry calves. My pantry was in need of some replenishment. So tell me about Maggie and Stokely, I asked. What's wrong with you, girls? Why are you rummaging through other people's trash looking for food? We took our coffee mugs into the living room, and they told me a sad story. Their father was a car mechanic. He lost his job when they were young and started drinking and beating them. Their mother divorced him, and they never saw him again. Detroit's economy was in complete disarray. Well, Detroit was a mess, and it was hard to find work. Their mother was driving a taxi, and one night she took the wrong passenger. He stabbed her with a knife for what little money she had and left her to bleed to death. They were placed in foster care, and the owner of the house began to harass them. They ran away and lived on the streets for three months. Their last name was Steele, and they worried about freezing to death, being raped or killed, and where their next meal would come from. I sat silently for a while after they finished talking. Jesus Christ, they broke my heart. I wonder how many people like them were there in the world. This was probably a more common story than I realized. I wonder if they will let me help them. I wondered how I could help them. It seemed unlikely that children's services would allow them to stay with me. A single man keeping two young girls sounded like something a pervert would dream of, and I was sure it wouldn't work with social services. They interrupted my thoughts. Mac, are you married? Stokely asked. It was, I told them. My ex decided that I was not ambitious enough. She's a hotshot lawyer, and she's been around all sorts of places. There was no place in her life for marriage. What a bitch, Maggie said. I laughed. She really is a very good person. She didn't cheat on me or anything, and we're still very close friends. We mutually decided that we should never have gotten married. We were very young and very stupid. How old are you? Stokely asked. I'm 28, I told her. How old are you? I'm 11 and she's 13, she said. What will you do today? What are we going to do today? I corrected her. Yes, what you said. We're going to talk, I told her. First, I'll introduce you to someone. I opened the garage door and a bunch of moving fur flew through the door. He noticed our guests and rushed towards them, jumped onto the sofa and lay on their laps, running his big pink tongue over them. This is Granville, I told them. I call him Grandma. They giggled hysterically as he licked them with his tongue. He weighs about a 130 pounds and they couldn't move him. I'm sure he weighed more than them. Lie down, Grandma, I told him. He reluctantly went down and lay down on their legs. He's huge, Stokely laughed, stroking his head. What kind of dog is this? He is striped like a tiger. This is a bull mastiff, I said. They call it Brindle, and that's why it's that color. He looks like he could bite our faces off, Maggie said. Yes, he could, but he won't. He is friendly with my friends. He sees you sitting in our house and being friendly. That's why he loves you. If you were belligerent towards me, he would be alarmed and very aggressive. Now that he knows you, he won't allow anyone to be belligerent towards you. If I yell at you, he won't like it. He cares a lot about the people he loves. Stockley jumped down and lay on top of him, wrapping her arms around his neck as he licked her hand. I love him, she said. He's so wrinkled and cute. Does he live in the garage? No, he lives in the house, I said. Yesterday he got sick and I put him outside so that he wouldn't vomit all over the house. Why did he get sick? asked Stokely. He eats something he shouldn't eat, I said. He chews sticks, eats bugs, dead crap he finds, and who knows what else. He seems fine today. Disgusting, Maggie exclaimed. He licked my face. Yes, he's cute, I said. And he's my buddy, so I just put up with him. He'll be your buddy too if you let him. We should take him for a walk. I took his leash and Maggie wanted to lead him. 
He basically leads a person with a leash, so she stayed a few yards ahead of Stokely and me and was dragged along. Stokely put her little hand in mine. I looked down at her and she smiled at me. God, she was beautiful. Everything is fine? She asked. Of course, baby, I said. I like holding hands with pretty girls. She blushed slightly but didn't let go of me. We walked a couple of miles and by the time we got back, Grandma was out of breath and drooling. It was cold, but he did it anyway. We drank more coffee and talked all day. Finally, I asked them if they would let me help them. What can you do? Asked Maggie. I really don't know, I told them. I could talk to Brianna. She is a lawyer, albeit of a different kind. Maybe she'll have some ideas. Is this the same bitch? Asked Maggie. Maggie, she's not a bitch, I told her. Stop calling her that. Do you trust me? They looked at each other and then back at me. Yeah, I guess, Stokely said. You are very kind to us. Well, let's call her and see if she comes, I said. You'll like her. Just give her a chance. Brianna was busy but said she would come over for dinner. Brie is a tall, gorgeous redhead. She's sexy as hell, but she never realized it. I could tell the girls were impressed when she walked in. She kissed me until my toes curled and hugged both girls. You replaced me, she winked at the girls. No, Brie, you're irreplaceable, you know, I joked. She was really pleased. I told the girls that we were still friends, and we were. We were friends with benefits. We still had great sex together, sometimes once a week or more. Sometimes she would come and stay with me for a week or so, and we would make love like rabbits. She simply didn't have time for a husband in her life, and I doubted she would ever be married again. She loved me in her own way, and I loved her too. We just couldn't be married. We got along great as sex buddies, but when we got married we fought like cats and dogs. So, who are your new girlfriends? She asked. She smiled at them, and I realized they were dazzled. I'm Maggie, and she's Stokely. Nice to meet you. Bree said. You know this guy is dangerous, right? Not for us, Stokely said. I think he could be dangerous to someone he was an enemy with. He has a club and a very large dog. Bree poked Grand Will with the toe of her boot, and he snored in protest. Hey, big guy. She knelt down and hugged him. Do you miss me? He rolled his eyes, but couldn't muster the strength to lift his head. What's the matter, Mac? She asked. What did you want to talk to me about? Not that I mind being invited to dinner. He's a fantastic cook, girls, if you can motivate him. I think he cooked lamb chops, Maggie said. We have never had anything like this. Well, then I'm in for a treat. But what's the big deal? She asked again. We had dinner, and I explained. We need your help, Bree, I told her. We don't know anything about legal things. The girls are orphans. Well, their father may be alive, but no one knows where he is. He abandoned them, and their mother was killed. They were in foster care, and some idiot started groping them. They ran away and are living on the streets. They were rummaging through my trash, looking for something to eat, and I caught them. Now we are trying to come up with something to prevent them from returning to the streets. She looked at me for a minute. You want them, don't you? Jesus Christ, Mac, you've always wanted children. And because I didn't give you any, you want them, don't you? I blushed. Yes, I kind of want to. What do you think is the best way to do this, Bree? I don't think it's possible, she said. No family court will give you two young girls. You are a lonely man. This is a recipe for disaster. They won't do it. I looked at the girls. They looked at me with wide eyes. What? I asked. They looked at each other and burst into tears. They both ran up and hugged me. Did you want to keep us with you? Stokely sobbed. I cannot believe it. I didn't think we'd ever find anyone. Anyone? She couldn't continue from sobbing. I held them tightly. Yes, girls, I thought about it. You need someone to look after you. I need someone to look after me. I thought we could do this together. Their little bodies trembled, and they clung tightly to me. I looked at Bree helplessly as tears streamed down her cheeks. She looked from the girls to me. Damn it, Mac, look what you did to me. 
Just when I think I know you, you always surprise me. What should I do with you? There was a strange expression on her face, as if she was seeing me for the first time. Let me think for a few days. Girls, you will come with me. You can't stay here with Mac. It would ruin everything if it ever came out. Mac, we're taking Grandma with us. I can't stay at home and he'll have to look after them. She looked like a tornado when she spun and carried her and her grandmother out of the house into her Mercedes. I'll call you, she said. She called for about 30 seconds, three times, over the next two weeks. I didn't see her or the girls until she called me Friday morning and said she wanted to meet me for dinner at Alfonso's. It's a cute Italian place in Pontiac, and we went there often. When I arrived, she was already there, sitting at the bar, and men were circling around her. When she saw me, she jumped up and left them drooling. We walked up to the booth. She nudged me and sat down next to me. She usually sat opposite me so that I knew something was going on. We ordered, and she didn't say anything for a while. You know I love you, right, Mac? She finally began. Yes, I love you too, said I. I don't mean that I love your mom or anything like that. I'm in love with you, Mac. I've always been like that since that day at Cedar Point. You are the only man I have ever loved or will ever love, she said. I trust you unconditionally. I love everything about you except the fact that we were married. You know what I'm like. I like to be free. No obligations, no baggage, nothing to tie me down. I love my job and my life. I don't love them any more than I love you, but I don't have to choose. You are as faithful as Grandma. We have mutual understanding. I don't make love to anyone but you. I've never done this, you know. You always understood me. That's why this is all going to sound weird as hell. Ooh, laughed I. Looks like I'm in for an unpleasant surprise. She gave me a you idiot look. Yes, I'm afraid that is so. Will you marry me, Mac? I almost choked on my wine. Wine in the trachea is a bad place for this. When I came to my senses, I just sat there with my mouth open. Stop being a fool and answer me, she barked. Hell no, I finally managed. Why, Brie? We make each other unhappy. In a month, we'll be at each other's throats. What's wrong with what we're doing now? Nothing, she replied. This has nothing to do with us. It has to do with the sweetest, most adorable girls on the planet, Mac. I'm head over heels in love with them. You completely ruined my life when you invited me that night. They are desperate to see you. They cry and beg me every night to come and see you. The problem is that I'm not going to give them up. Never in my life have I had so much fun and pleasure as since they have been with me. None of us have a stable home environment. No judge in his right mind would give them to any of us. If we were married, they would give them to us in a heartbeat. So I need them, and I'll have to take you as part of the package. If you want them, you'll have to put up with me. Can we do this, Mac? I doubt it, I told her. You're as bad as me. You come home drunk, you never show up on time for anything except your work, and you may not come home at all or even call me. Damn it, Bree, we've been there and done that. Yes, I know. The point is, what if things are different now? I can't wait to get home tonight. I always call them if I'm late, and since I've had them, I've only had one glass of wine a night. It never occurred to me that I could feel this way. Marry me, Mac. Give me a chance. I think we need to talk about something, I said. So speak. What the hell are we doing? Do you think I'm just flapping my gums here? Tell me what's about to happen. Do you want me to start first? I took a long sip and signaled to the waiter for another glass of wine. Shoot, I told her. What infuriates me most about you is that you want to control me, she said. You must know everything I do, in the smallest detail. When I'll be there, who I'm with, what I'm doing, when I'll be home. You're kind of paranoid. If you would just stop trying to control me and let me be myself, we'd still be married. You will never be able to do this. It drives me crazy. Surely you already know that you are the only man I am ever interested in. You know that, right, Mac? Yes, probably, I said. It used to irritate the hell out of me. I was afraid that you would find someone and leave me. This will never happen, she promised. I've never even thought about another man since the day I first met you. I go out to dinner with clients and colleagues. I go dancing with groups, men and women. 
I am having fun. This is what I do. But from the moment I met you, no man or woman has ever touched me intimately and never will. Do you believe me? Yes, it's the same for me. I trust you, Bree. I know that you will never harm me. You're just so carefree and carefree. I am as in love with you as I was on the first day of our wedding. I think you feel the same way about me and we were comfortable where we were. Well, I'm not like that anymore, she said. There are two girls who need a family. I love them almost as much as I love you. I love them more than my job. I want to be a part of their life, and I see that this can only happen when we do it together. So, will you give me a chance, Mac? Will you marry me and try to love me so we can have this family together? I will never have children. I'm too vain and selfish to do this to myself. However, we can take these girls. Marry me, Mac and I'll do everything I can to make you extremely happy, okay? Obviously, you've had time to think about it, I said. Give me some time too, okay? She glanced at her watch. You have 20 minutes, she said. Oh my God, do I have some kind of deadline? I asked. Yes, they will be waiting for us outside in 20 minutes, she said. They should be here in 10 minutes. They will walk with Grandma for about 10 minutes, and then a car will pick us up to take us to your home. We quickly finished our food and went outside. There was a limo waiting there, but the girls were nowhere to be seen. The driver told us that they were walking the dog. He didn't seem to approve of the dog. Maybe he didn't like the drool on the upholstery. We waited a few minutes, and I saw them rushing to the car. Let's go, Maggie said as they approached us. There's a guy watching us. Grandma doesn't like him. He growled at him. I looked down at the sidewalk and saw a young man approaching. He was about 20 years old and had tattoos and piercings. He was wearing a knit cap and hood, and his trousers looked like they were about to fall off of him. I think he was under the impression that he looked like a bandit. What are you looking at? He turned to me. Nothing. We're just leaving, I said. I think it's all yours. A good sports jacket, beautiful women, a big car, he said. Looks like you have some extra money. The dude was crazy. I was eight inches taller than him and probably a hundred pounds heavier. I also don't have a fat belly. I think you better move on, boy, I told him. My dog really doesn't like you. He came within about four feet. I'm not afraid of any dog, he said. How much money do you have with you? He put his hand under his jacket to the top of his trousers, and I saw a flash of metal. I kicked him in the chest and he flew back. A gun fell out of his pants and onto the ground. Maggie lost her grandmother's leash when he jumped. The guy had the presence of mind to protect his face with his hand, and I heard the crunch as Grandma broke his forearm. He screamed, and the grandmother tore the sleeve of his hood. Granville, to your feet, I shouted. He pulled down his sleeve and sat down next to me. The guy was writhing on the ground, and I walked over and knelt down next to him, Grandma next to me. Take it, Grandma, I told him. He jumped forward, and the guy froze as huge jaws closed on his neck. I think you're an asshole, I told him. What are you, an idiot? He nodded slightly, his face frozen in fear. Say it, I told him. He didn't answer. Bite, Grandma, I said. He screamed slightly, and I saw blood run down his neck as the huge fangs tore the skin. You could hear the snoring air coming in and out of Grandma's nose. Say it, I repeated. I'm an asshole, he breathed. How much money do you have? I asked him. Give them to me, he reached into his pocket, and Grandma must have squeezed him tighter. Slowly, I told him when he turned around. He pulled out a package and handed it to me. Let him go, Grandma, I said. He reluctantly let go, and the guy backed away. I'll give you a 20-yard head start, I said. Then I will send him to you. I suggest you run fast. He ran like a sprinter. He went up about 15 feet, and his pants fell down. He stumbled violently and jumped up, pulling up his pants and holding them with his good hand as he ran. You need a belt, I shouted. I turned to the girls, and all three stood with their mouths open. I kicked the gun into the storm drain hole. What? I asked. Bree was the first to unfreeze. You're a nasty son of a bitch. You're not to be messed with, Mac. Remind us not to make you angry. 
The girls rushed to me, and I hugged them. Oh my God, Mac, Stokely whispered into my chest. I thought this guy was scary. You, you did it and didn't even break a sweat. Thank you. You did this for us, didn't you? Well, no one messes with my girls, I told her. He left you a small donation for your college fund. I handed her the pakagi. She counted. It contained 700. He must have robbed a few more poor suckers recently. She shared it with Maggie and we got into the car. I turned back a little, hugging Maggie, and noticed something. A van is coming for us, I said. I know, Bree said. It contains some of our things. I raised one eyebrow at her. Yes, I know I take a lot for granted, she chuckled. Girls, Max said yes. We will get married again and keep you with us. They gasped and screamed. Really, Mac? asked Maggie. She's really not a bitch. You were right. We love Bree. She was so kind to us. We have a ton of new clothes and she got us into this wonderful school. We'll make you guys so proud of us. I promise you will never regret it. We know you will, darling. Don't worry about it, Bree said. I was in some shock. I tried to say something, but the words wouldn't come out of my mouth. Are you okay, Mac? Stokely asked. Bree laughed. No, he goes into full panic mode. His carefully ordered world is turned upside down. Everything in his house is spotless. Everything is in perfect condition. He'll have women's panties hanging in his shower and will mix up his books and leave drink rings on the coffee table and it'll drive him crazy. Honestly, I don't know how he manages to live with Granville. We'll have to love him so much that he won't care if there are crumbs on the table. Do you think we can do this? I think you can, Maggie laughed. I don't know how we... Oh, he loves pretty girls, Bree assured them. All you have to do is bat your e-lashes at him and he will melt. Also, he will be angry with me. This will make me angry and you girls will have to love us for it, okay? I groaned. I didn't actually agree to any of this, I said. Bree behaves like a normal hurricane and simply sweeps us off our feet. Do you love Bree? Stokely asked me. Yes, I love her on the other side of the city, I tried to explain. Yes, but we all need to be together to be together, Maggie said. They all laughed at this statement, and I had to join them. The idea was ridiculous. How could I lose control like that? As usual, Brianna has just taken over. My little investigation into helping girls turned into a full-blown marriage and adoption scheme. With such small actions, your whole life gets out of control. I thought it was a foolhardy plan and told Bree as soon as we got to my house. There was a flurry of activity and movers were carrying mountains of stuff inside and putting them in different rooms. To my surprise, piles of women's clothing appeared one after another in Maggie's and Stokely's rooms. Where did you girls get all this? I asked Maggie as she rushed past. Bree took us shopping a few times, she said, disappearing into her room. Bree poked her head out of my room. God, Mac, don't you ever get rid of anything? You have things that you had when we got married. I'm throwing this away. I need drawers and closet space. I rushed to rescue my school jacket with letters from the trash heap. Stop it, Brianna, I shouted. These things cannot be thrown away. If I didn't want it, I wouldn't have it. Damn it, this is my home and I will throw your bony ass out if you don't stop. She stuck her head out and gave me a fierce look. Bony ass, huh? She snorted. She grabbed me by the sleeve of my jacket and dragged me into the bedroom. It looks like a cyclone has hit. In one motion, she locked the door, pulled her dress over her head and leaned over, placing her hands on the bed. It took my breath away. She wasn't wearing any panties. We made love. The next morning, I slept until 10 o'clock and then stumbled into the shower. By the time I shaved and showered, I began to feel vaguely human. Brie was still sleeping, her flame-colored hair falling in her face as she lay on her stomach. God, her ass was amazing. I went into the living room and Grandma was asleep and drooling over a pile of my best shirts. I sighed. I took a glass of orange juice and a bun. Let's go, Grandma, I told him. Let's leave this scene of destruction. He raised his head, rolled his eyes, and rose to his feet with a groan. We went out into the backyard, and he did his thing and came over to lie on my legs. I soaked up the sun, feeling as lazy as a big fat lizard. It was a very warm day for this time of year.
The door opened, and Stokely came out with a glass of milk and a bun. Hello, Angel? I waved my hand at her. Hello, Mac. She closed the door. She stood there for a minute, and then walked over to the glider where I was sitting. Is there enough room for me? She asked. I moved over, and she sat on my lap, placing her feet on the empty space I had made. She curled up with a sigh and took a bite of the bun. Her big green eyes pierced my soul. Mac, she began, muffin crumbs scattering across our laps. Ah, ah, I told her. First, eat, drink milk, swallow, and then talk. She giggled but didn't try to speak again until her mouth was empty. Mac, she began again, if you adopt us, will you be our dad and Bree our mom? Would you like this? I asked her. Oh, yes, she said. Bree would be the coolest mom in the world. You're not cool, but I think you're more reliable. I love you, and I think you would be the best father in the world. I almost choked. Well, I muttered. I think it's good to be reliable, even if you're not cool. She laughed. I didn't mean it. I mean, she's like a force of nature, and you're like a mountain. You know, she really, really loves you. She talks about you all the time. She told us everything about you and her. Do you love her? Yes, dear, but you said it yourself. She is a force of nature. It's like trying to love a thunderstorm or a forest fire. Mountains don't care about thunderstorms or forest fires, she said. Maggie kind of looks like her. I'm more like you, she pressed herself against my chest. I think that if we wanted, we could just let them circle around us, and we would be like the calm in the center of their storm. She looked at me. I want you to be our father, Mac. I never thought we'd find someone like you. And Bree, too. She cried a little. We were so scared and so alone, Mac. Do you have room in your life for girls like us? I hugged her small figure closer to me. In my heart, Stokely, there is a place in my heart. I've wanted someone like you and Maggie to love me for years. I didn't think I would ever have something like this. Bree had never shown the slightest interest in having children. I think you girls ruined her life just as much as you ruined mine. I saw the way she looks at you. It was as if she woke up two weeks ago and discovered that she loved being a mother. I've never seen anything affect her the way you do. You were right about her, she admitted. She is great. Sometimes it's just stunning. She decides to do something and just drags you along with her. I laughed. I know, right? She's always been like this. The first time I met her, a group of college students and I went to an amusement park. She decided that I would be her riding partner. Actually, I came because I was interested in another girl. She dragged me away, and we never saw the other people in our group again. We were 20, and I fell in love with her that day. She's like a virus. It just invades and takes over your life. We had our first fight a month after our wedding. Why did you quarrel? she asked. You'll think this is funny, I told her. It was about shoes. She continued to move mine and put hers in their place. I had to dig through her things to find mine. She says I'm obsessed. She might be right, but is it too much to ask her to keep her shoes on her side of the closet? She just exploded then. I drove her crazy and she drove me crazy. I have a plan for what I'm going to do tomorrow. She is completely spontaneous. It's part of who she is, and I like it, but it drives me crazy. She loves how organized I am, but it drives her crazy. However, these things collide and we just get on each other's nerves. She giggled. Maggie and I fight about things like this, too. She spends half her life trying to find what she lost. She gets up and, just on the spur of the moment, decides what we're going to do. I think we need to change a little, Mac. We need to go with the flow a little. They need to change some things, too. They need to understand that we like things to be in the right place. Do you think we can solve this? I don't know, I answered. We never had any reason to try. Bree and I have a really weird relationship. I love her now more than ever. I think she feels the same about me. She's not one to talk about it. She's just doing something. We're closer now than when we were married, and I like her. When we were married, I didn't do much. I loved her but we were always angry with each other. We kind of got to the point where we kind of got married, but we didn't need to change. 
I think we were too immature and selfish, but it worked for us. Maybe we just needed you to make us realize what we're missing. The idea of being a family is very exciting but also scary. What if we mess it up? We risk everything in a game of chance. I hate uncertainty. I know, but sometimes you just have to take a chance, she said. You can't get anything good without taking the risk that it might turn out bad. I hugged her, and she purred like a kitten. You are the wisest 11-year-old I have ever met, I said. I'll be 12 next month, she said. She finished the bun, and we returned to the house. The other two had not yet gotten up, and we took Grandma for a walk. By the time we returned, the lazy ones were already on their feet. Bree has never been a morning person, and apparently neither has Maggie. They both looked like beautiful, disheveled, sleepy cats. They stretched and yawned for a long time. When they came out of the shower, they looked like human dynamos. Bree whisked us away to get our marriage license, file for adoption, start temporary custody, and then head out to dinner. We had seafood, and the girls raved about how delicious it was. They were really excited about the prices. Wow, Mac, you must be making a ton of money, Maggie said. I laughed. I'm fine, I told her. I don't mind you knowing. I make about $90,000 a year. I could take care of all of us if I needed it. Bree makes ten times more than me. They looked at her, stunned for a minute. She laughed. It's just money, she said. The point is that we can afford to invite you girls to eat whenever you want. Mac can do most things better than restaurants if we can get him to cook. You cook? Maggie asked her. Yes, but mostly simple things, she said. Anyone can follow the recipe, but Missy is a genius. She's really very good, I told them. If she could get rid of her unfortunate habit of being distracted, she'd be great. She hit me. Make one mistake, and he'll never let you forget it, she laughed. I snorted. The first year we got married, we didn't have a dog that would eat burnt things. If you throw it in the trash, the whole house stinks. She would take it out into the backyard and drop it at the base of a tree. It was as if we were making a burnt offering to the tree god. They laughed loudly. Bree was in a very good mood and snuggled up to me. I hugged her and squeezed her tightly. The girls giggled. We've never eaten at a place like this, Maggie said. Maggie? Bree looked at her seriously. This will never happen. You'll kick Mac out of the house in a week if you keep talking like that. I know you can do better. Say it again, Maggie thought for a moment. We've never eaten at a place like this, she said with a triumphant smile at my nod. We know how to talk. I mean talk, she said. We just got into the habit of talking, like all the other people on the street. We went to school until my mother died. We had good grades. I believe you, honey, Bree said. I think you'll succeed. We may be from Detroit, but we have class. The girls looked like they were about to burst with pride. She also gave them lessons. They dressed the same as her. She showed them how to walk, how to sit, how to eat and drink, how to put on makeup and comb their hair. After six months, one would have thought that they had spent their whole lives growing up and being educated in New England in high society. They were fast and their grades were good. That night, was the beginning. Bree was excited. When we got home, she told the girls that she wanted them to turn on the TV and leave it on all night. They looked at her curiously. Your father and I need to do something, she winked at them. They giggled hysterically and turned beet red. Bree pulled me into the bedroom. We are celebrating, she told me. What are we celebrating? I asked. The beginning of something amazing, she said. I love you, Mac. Never doubt it. We're going to do this. Every night I will remind you that I love you, and then I will show you how. We've always been dynamite in bed. Tonight I want to take this to a whole new level. Then we will keep at this level for the rest of our lives. Do you understand? Show me, I challenged her. She pulled the pin out of her hair and all those flickering flames came crashing down. She rarely wears her hair down, but it reaches the top of her butt. They are very heavy and wavy, and she twirled them like a stripper as they fell around her. She stepped towards me and turned her back. Stretch lightning for me, she said in a low, passionate voice. I unzipped the blue dress, letting my knuckles slide down her back. She winced and took two steps to the side, 
spinning and letting her hair fly. She dropped her shoulders, and the dress fell, hanging briefly on her chest and again on her thighs before falling at her feet. She walked out gracefully, her three-inch heels making her calves pop, sticking out her ass and arching her back. Her breasts were impressive, too, large and perky, barely contained by her white lace bra. God, she was great. I don't think she ever realized the effect she had on every man who saw her. She wasn't ashamed of herself at all. The men revolved around her flame, and she looked at them like so many fireflies. She turned all that smoky heat on me, and I think I was the only man who ever saw it. Her hands slid behind her back, and her bra fell away, leaving those impressive breasts jumping out, magnificently exposed, her creamy white skin showing freckles here and there. I think someone is overdressed, she teased. And what are we going to do about it? I asked. She came, gliding like flowing water, pushed me onto the bed and straddled me, her knees resting on the bed next to my hips. I could smell her arousal. It was a subtle scent, almost masking the Chanel she always smelled of. It was a faint musky scent, tantalizing and seductive. Her thin, long, deft fingers undid the buttons on my shirt, pulled the tails out of my trousers, pulled them off my shoulders and left my hands trapped. She pushed my back onto the bed, reaching to unbuckle my belt and pants before tugging on the waistband. I obediently raised my hips and she pulled my pants down to my ankles. They were hanging on my boots and she untied them, removing them and my socks before kicking off my pants. This was a whole new level of sensuality, even from Brie. She was always hot, but she turned into a neon sign that said, Take me in pink letters. This was the woman I always knew she was and could be. She was a creature of fascination and mystery, waiting to be taken and claimed. I think that was the moment I truly realized how much I loved her. I knew I would die for her and would never question that sacrifice. We got into a very passionate, wild love that never before were doing. She raised her head and looked into my eyes. Mac, I love you, she said. I always knew it. I'm a selfish bitch. I know that too. I've never really given myself to anyone. I just did this to you. Do you want me, Mac? I think for the first time in my life, I'm ready. I am ready to be your friend, your lover, your wife, mother of girls. Will you help me, love me, and be patient with me? I swear to God you will never regret this. I'm ready, Mac, if you help me. Do you love me as much? I crushed her luscious lips with mine. I love you more than anything in the world, said I. You will have to help me, too. You must be patient with me just as I am with you. I've always loved you. If we are a team, we can do it. I will do anything for you, she whispered. I'll do it for the girls, too. It never occurred to me that I would feel this way. They just came into my life and I can't help it. I'm scared, Mac. I'm afraid I'll be a bad mom. I was always afraid of this. That's why I would never think about having children. I'm afraid I'll ruin them. God, Mac, I don't know how to be a mom. Well, I don't know how to be a father either, I chuckled. But I suspect I'll be a great father. I think that's what you learn by doing it. No one knows how it will happen once they learn. I don't know how to be a husband either. Anyway, I don't know how to be a good husband. We screwed up the first time, Brianna. I know, she whispered. Mostly it was me. I was such a child. In many ways, I still am, Mac. I will try my best to grow up. Yes. Me too. I held her close to me. At some point, we fell asleep. Waking up, we they took a shower together, giggling like schoolchildren, and when they dried off, she put on her pajamas. What are you doing? I asked. If I'm not mistaken, we will have guests soon, she smiled. You better wear something too. I'm too lazy to get up now. I pulled on my boxers and a t-shirt, and we hadn't been in bed for ten minutes when someone knocked on the door. Come in. Brie called. Stokely poked her head inside. Her face lit up when she saw us, and she ran across the room to rush at us. Unfortunately, she left the door open, and the tiger ball of fur also joined us, lying across our legs and sighing in ecstasy. After another five minutes, Maggie joined us, and we all had an impromptu wrestling match with Grandma, 
Since he had teeth and drool, he won, and we wrapped him in a blanket and dragged him out of the bedroom. We managed to isolate ourselves from him and troop back to bed to cuddle. About half an hour later, the girls complained of hunger, and we headed to the diner for breakfast. At 2 p.m., Bree announced that we had an appointment. She didn't tell us what it was, but she took us to the municipal court. Do you have business here? I asked her. Yes, the most difficult case in my life, she laughed. She dragged us inside and into one of the courtrooms. The magistrate was there, and he asked us if we were ready. Are you ready for what? I asked. Bree knelt down and took a box out of her purse. Mac, will you marry me again? She asked. This time I promise that it will be like this until our death. I know we promised this last time, but you know that I never stopped loving you and never stopped wanting to be your wife. You are the only man I have ever loved or will ever love. Please, Mac, marry me. She had our wedding rings in a box along with her wedding ring. Brianna, are you sure? I asked her. I've never been so sure of anything in my life, she said. Girls, help me. He is so stubborn. Yes, please, Mac, they both begged. Bree really loves you. We want to be a family. We love you too, and we love Bree. How could I resist? It took about ten minutes, and it was done. Bree took us to a new Greek restaurant she knew she was going to celebrate, and I saw my life unfold before my eyes. The most gorgeous woman in the world as my wife and in my bed every night. Two stunning daughters, who will quickly become beautiful women. Was there happiness? Can we do it? Only time will tell. It took us about a month to get custody of the girls. Bree worked tirelessly to make it happen, and when it did, they were the happiest girls on earth, and we were the happiest couple. Bree sold her apartment, and we lived in my house. I was really worried that Bree and I were getting on each other's nerves, especially at first. About three weeks after we got married, there was a small flare-up when Bree went to dinner with a client and forgot to call us. When she returned home, she was greeted by six accusing eyes. What? she asked. Stokely picked up the phone and Bree's eyes flashed with understanding. She opened her mouth and burst into tears. She ran up and gathered us all on the couch, knelt down in front of us and just started sobbing. I'm so sorry, she managed. I just forgot to call. I should have called. Please do not be mad at me. I'll try not to do this again. I don't promise not to do this, but I will tell my assistant to remind me. I couldn't think of anything other than finishing this meeting and getting home while I was there. Do you forgive me? Stokely, Maggie, Mac, I'm so sorry. I don't think Bree has apologized a dozen times in her life. This was the beginning of a completely new relationship between us. We both tried our best to make each other happy, and the girls were amazing at helping us. At times, it seemed to me that we were children, and they were adults. We had some small disagreements, but I have never been so happy and content in my life. There was a private school on campus where I taught, and Bree enrolled the girls there. They traveled with me to and from school, and we became close during these trips. They talked to me about everything, and they just filled my life with their enthusiasm. When classes ended, we went home, and they immediately went to their rooms and did their homework. It usually took them a couple of hours, and when they finished, we took Grandma for a walk. We started dinner at 5 if we ate at home, and Bree usually got home by 6.30. If she was going to be late, she called in advance, and on those evenings we usually went out to eat. When Maggie turned 16, Brianna asked what she wanted for her birthday. She told us she wanted to get her driver's license. She studied and practiced for two weeks, and she passed the exams on the first try. The night before her birthday, Brianna talked to me in bed. I want to buy her a car, she said. Okay, what kind of car is this? I asked. I want to buy her a new Camaro convertible, she said. How much does it cost? I asked. Jesus, Mac, does it really matter? She asked, do you think we'll go broker? No, I don't think it matters, I said. I just like to know everything, Bree. I know, she kissed me. I'm sorry I attacked you. I think we can get the one I want for around 60,000. I whistled. This is a big and expensive car. She's an amazing girl, though. She deserves it. Yes, Brianna smiled. 
There were a lot of bad things in their lives, Mac. Let's make sure they only have good things now. We ordered a car. It was bright yellow with many black stripes and a black interior. We went ahead and got a big V8 against my better judgment. Brianna thought it would hold its value better, and she was probably right. Either way, I knew she would drive Maggie crazy. When the car arrived, we parked it in the garage, and when it was time to go to school, the girls grabbed their bags and followed me to the car. Brianna was in the garage, and I didn't unlock the doors. Dad, Stokely said, let us in. You won't go with me today, I shouted. You drive the car, Maggie. Mom isn't going to work, she asked. No, she's leaving, I said. Then what will I ride, she asked. I pressed the garage door opener. You'll be driving, I pointed inside the garage. Her big green eyes became round as saucers. Neither of them moved for a minute and then Maggie began to cry. Large tears rolled down her cheeks and she trembled like an aspen leaf. I jumped out of the car and Brianna ran down the driveway. I hugged Maggie and Bree joined me. What happened, dear? I, I asked her. We thought you would be happy. This is your car. We give it to you for your birthday. She tried to tell us something, but she was too depressed for us to understand her. She buried her face in my chest and we held her and stroked her until she calmed down enough to talk. Stokely joined the group and we finally got Maggie to talk. I don't need a car, she squeezed out. I love you guys so much and this is too much. I, we, we don't want you to have to buy us things. Stokely and I have already talked about this. We don't need anything. We just need you to love us. She couldn't stand it again. Honey, we really love you, Brianna consoled her. We love you both more than anything in the world. Having you girls is a dream come true for both of us. We love buying things for you, though. We work and earn a lot of money to buy things for our girls. We love making you happy. This is part of how we show you that we love you. It's not a big way, but it's a small way. This makes us happy to give you things. Stockley was crying now, too. I kissed them both on the cheeks. Let's go, I told them. This is a really cool car. Let's at least go and look at her. They wiped their eyes and let me take them to the garage. I opened the door for Maggie, and Brianna let Stokely into the passenger seat. Maggie put her hands on the steering wheel and looked at me. A smile appeared on her beautiful face. It suits you, I told her. Start her up. The big V8 rumbled to life, and they were both shaking with excitement. I closed the door and knocked on the window. She lowered it, and I kissed her again. See you at school, I told her. She drove out onto the street and stopped. Brianna and I stood nearby, watching them. Her door swung open and she flew back out into the driveway, throwing herself into our arms and kissing us both, over and over again. I love you so much, she repeated over and over. Thank you, you are the best mom and dad on earth. She ran to her car and they drove off. I turned to Brianna and she was crying like a baby. For some inexplicable reason, tears flowed from my own eyes. Look at us, I said. You'd think there were three of us or something like that. That was a great idea, Bree. You are an amazing woman. We hugged each other for a long time. I knew I would be late for class, but I didn't care. When Stokely turned 16, we gave her the same car. It wasn't that emotional, but it was something special. We took them to Hawaii and Belize when they graduated from high school. Maggie was already in college. The day Stokely started college, I came home to find Brianna crying on the couch. I went and sat next to her, hugged her, and sat for a while without saying a word. She just laid her head on my chest and cried quietly for a while. Finally, she looked up at me with her big blue eyes, full of tears. Our children are grown up, Mac, she said. I know. I kissed her. This is what children do. She took my face in her hands and looked deeply into my eyes. Let's make another one, Mac, she said. This time you and I. I want a baby Mac. She couldn't stand it and started crying. I never thought this would happen. I love you so much, and I already miss them so much. I want to do this again. It was so amazing. I know they're only 60 miles away, but I miss them. Me too, kitten, I said. Maybe if we're going to have this baby, we should go practice. She gasped and stared at me. 
Really? Do you want it? I mean, having a baby? Of course, I said. I hope it's a red-haired girl like you. I love you with all my heart, Brianna. I picked her up and carried her through the empty house to our bedroom to start practicing. We had to kick Granville out, but I decided I liked making babies. As I drifted off to sleep, the picture on the nightstand of Maggie and Stockley held my eyes. They didn't look like a Ford, exactly. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.